So lesson 36, transducers and sensors. We will be able to use transducers in a circuit. Let's go quickly back before we talk about what transducers and sensors are, where have we come from? We've just come from learning about voltage dividers. In fact, we've been learning about, firstly, how a voltage divider exists and is set up to set a specific voltage out. Then we sort of talked about, well, what if you replace one of these voltage a voltage divider with this, a variable resistor, or a, uh, in this case, a potentiometer. A potentiometer will set a particular kind of um, output, a particular kind of resistance through a certain point. It's like pretty much a, um, it's like pretty much a voltage divider in a single component, in a single circuit. And what you end up with is you end up with a different voltage drop over certain parts of the uh, voltage divider. We then briefly talked about non-ohmic devices and circuits. We've already done stuff like this, so I didn't spend much time on it. And then I said to you guys, I think I said to start working 4.4. I actually believe we should have written this down on the Google page because this was going to be homework for you to do. But we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a sec. Let's talk about transducers instead. What is a transducer? A transducer is just a device, a device that changes energy from one form to another form. For example, electricity to light. So electricity to light, that would be something like an LED. But look, all of these are examples of transducers. Electrical energy to sound, electromagnetic energy to electricity, heat energy to electrical, stored mechanical energy to electrical. Most of these involve electricity. I don't know if they all have to involve electricity, but they most of them do. Um, but that's when we talk about transducer, we're talking about changing energy from one form to a different form. You don't have to memorize all of these. The idea, of course, is that you guys should be able to just go, oh, I know what a microphone does. It takes something like sound and it turns that into electrical energy or some kind of voltage or some kind of impulse. That's what we're talking about here. Now, we can go the other way as well, by the way. We can take uh, an electrical we can take something like an electrical signal and turn that into sound and that would be a loudspeaker so it's directly above it. So it's kind of like for most of these you can go one way or you can go the other way. For example, you can add energy and create heat. You can create, add heat and create energy. You can even go the other way around. So these are all transducers. Now, we're not going to talk about all of these. We're only going to talk about some of them. By the way, these ones in the bottom, this is kind of cool. I've, I've been looking those up recently just because I've seen them around. They actually, uh, the more electricity you put in, the colder they get. Well, they, what they do is they actually split and they actually move. They actually create a, a path for heat to go from one way to the other way. It kind of looks like it's breaking it kind of looks like it's breaking the thermodynamic, first thermodynamic rule, but it's not because the heat's getting transferred into the battery as well. But it's kind of, it's interesting if you want to look that up. What about sensors? A sensor is a subset of transducers, or it's otherwise known as an input transducer. Mm -hmm. They convert energy like light, heat, sound into electrical energy or other things that can change electrical energy or things that can change electrical energy. They're very, very similar, but I guess the reason is that it's specifically going from an outside source into electrical energy. So and most simple circuits will like, we've been talking about basic circuits like, oh, you know, you switch on a switch and a light bulb goes on, but that's, when we start to talk about more, I guess, complex circuits, we're looking at this sort of setup going on here. You have an input transducer, so you're taking some information from outside. You're processing it, and then you're then going, you're then outputting it. 
So an example might be a um, light sensor on a camera. A light sensor on a camera has an input transducer, has a particular device that will convert energy like light into electrical energy. That electrical energy is then processed and it will change it into something and that will change it to an output. That output might be anything. In this case, it could be a motor that automatically changes the aperture. It could be of the camera to make it, to make sure less light gets in. You could have it that if you um, if it's too dark, then it will uh, set off a flash. You know, it will charge up a capacitor, so a flash can go off. There are so many things that you could do. You could have a um, a sensor that when it hears sound, the signal will mean that it will like close a lid or something. You know, these are the kinds of things that um or set off a really if it hears a sound, maybe it will set up an alarm and a loud sound and put lights on. These are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we talk about more complex circuits. Now, so I'm going to talk about three types of transducer and we're going to talk about them in three different types of situations. Now, these transducers that we're going to talk about, you don't necessarily need to memorize every single itty bitty fact about the transducer realistically how they work in a circuit is more important and a lot of this is also going to be a little bit revision like a little bit going back over things that you may have seen in the past that will help us to reaffirm what we're doing um so let's jump into the first one thermistor Thermistors are variable resistors that have resist their, their resistance change as their temperature change changes. So the idea is that thermistor is a transducer that measures temperature. It changes as the temperature changes. Thermistors are either, and they actually have a name for these, are either PTC or NTC. I actually looked up what these stand for is potential positive temperature coefficient or negative temperature coefficient. But I thought to myself, do, the, do, do you guys really need to know what PTC and NTC stand for? Not really. If you guys forget this after this lesson, I'm okay with that. But just for those of you that wanna know, a PTC resistance goes up with temperature. With an NTC resistance goes down with temperature. What that means is for the PTC, as it gets hotter, the resistance will go up. And so knowing which one of these resistors to use in a circuit could be useful. What are some circuits that use thermistors? Well, heating units, they're great if you have an automatic one. I've got a heater running at the moment and it's set to 20 degrees. That means that when a particular thermistor in the house re-registers 20 degrees, it'll shut off the heater. Fridges, turn on the fridge when the uh turn on the fridge when the temperature unit reaches a certain condition ovens um anything with a heating element so like if you've got like a soldering iron even like an iron so just a regular like iron because that'll turn off its heating part when it gets to a certain temperature you might have a 3d printer that gets hot and it will turn off It'll stop heating up the 3D printer when you, if it overloads. So these are great for any way where you need to measure the temperature. And it doesn't matter if you're measuring hot, if you want to measure when it gets to a certain hot temperature. You might have a temperature alarm. Servers have temperature alarms so that if, they, if something's going wrong. Computers have temperature sensors in them so that you know that when your, your uh, CPU is getting too hot, it'll turn on a fan. So I'm just wanting to give you guys a bunch of examples because I could easily just, you could easily get a question and test, which is just like, when would you use a thermistor? What, give an example of a circuit with a thermistor. So any of these circuits could have thermistors. Let's now look at an actual question here and see how we go with dealing with thermistors. So this is straight from our textbook. The resistance of a thermistor changes with temperature as shown in the following, right? 
in the voltage divider circuit showed that the miss is one of the two resistors. So this is how we start to include these into circuits. And this is why I taught you voltage dividers yesterday. So that today we could quickly and easily jump into using them. The other is a resistor with fixed resistance value. Okay, so we've got this circuit here. This is a new way of writing things, by the way. You might be like, what's going on here? But this is just a cat touch to a nine volt battery. What we're saying is that at the top, it's nine volts. So the main, the hot wire, the wire with all the voltage is nine volts. When it gets to the other end, it's zero volts, which makes sense. When you get to the end, it's zero volts. Um, and there's going to be some potential difference between here and here, which will be the voltage, which will be how much goes over here. Let's read the rest of the question. As the temperature drops, the resistor of the resistance of the temperature, the resistance of the temperature increases. So we can see what they're saying is as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down. This is would be an N T C. If you wanted to, but that's a bit nerdy. We don't need to know that, but just in case you did, you're going down as temperature goes up. And as it gets colder, the resistance goes up. Um, each share of the voltage from the power supply will also increase. That of the fixed value of the resistor will decrease. So that means what you're saying is, as it gets colder, the resistance goes up. As, so as the temperature, let's actually draw this down. I actually do these a lot. So as the temp goes down, the resistance goes up. As the resistance goes up, the voltage drop will go up. And that's actually this simple statement here that I've got at the top. This is enough to answer a lot of questions. Okay. So we wanted if this device happens to get, this device happens to get, you know, more voltage dropped over it, the colder it gets. So this could very easily be something like a heater, you know, at a, or something that's, you know, we want to, when it gets cold, we want to make sure it's something turns on. So yeah, well, maybe an electric blanket. Who knows? Um, a voltage sensitive switch is placed across the thermistor. It is built turn on to or turn on a heater. Ah, it's exactly what I thought. When the voltage across the thermistor is greater than six volts, your task as a circuit designer is to determine the resistance value required for the fixed resistor value to turn on at 19 degrees Celsius. So these are some of the pieces of information that I want to talk about. So let's, so we want to know, we want this value here to be six volts. Okay. Which means that we want to drop six volts across here. And we want to drop six volts across here when we reach 19 degrees. Okay, well, if we look here at 19 degrees Celsius, we've got a resistance of about, let's call that 1.4 kiloohms. So let's write this down at 19 degrees. The resistance, the R thermistor at 19 degrees, R thermistor equals um, 1.4 kilo ohms. We can tell this is non ohmic because this is not a linear graph. Well, we can tell it's not only ohmic because it, the resistance can change, full stop. This is not, it's not about the fact that this is linear or not, because this is not a voltage times current graph. So, and I got 1.4 because I was like, okay, well, 1.5 is here. You could write 1.5, you were at 1.5, I'd be like, yeah, that's close enough. Uh, we just want to see if it's close enough. So now we know the, and we also know the voltage drop over the, the mister. That has to be six volts. So now we can tell, calculate the current over the thermistor. That's the voltage divided by the resistance, which is going to be um, 6 divided by 
Come since the pathway equals six divided by one thousand four hundred equals four point three milliamps. Okay. Great. Cool. So, so we want to know what the resistance of R is, though. So now we know. Um, and can someone tell me what does the voltage drop over R have to be? You know what? I'm going to ask this question to the to the chat. Can someone tell me what does the resist voltage drop over R have to be? Do you want me to unmute everyone? Get ready. What is, yeah, that was, that was Adri, I think. I mean, that wasn't on. I don't know. What was, what is the resistance? What's the voltage drop over the R resistor? Any ideas? Can be wrong. Don't care if it's wrong. Three? Someone said three. Three is correct. Yes, it is three volts. Thank God. Because I thought I was going to be waiting here all day. Um, Three volts is correct. The reason that you can work out it's three volts is because it's nine volts in total, which means that three volts needs to get dropped here. Okay, so now the resistor has it has a voltage of that resistor divided by the current. We now know the voltage is three volts. We know the current is 4.3 times 10 to the negative 3, so 0 0.0043, etc. Um, and therefore, 3 divided by that will give me the resistance of about, I got 700 ohms. You might get close to 700 ohms, that's fine. And um, if you didn't get exactly 700 ohms, if you did it, you got maybe 680, it doesn't matter. But as long as it's between like about 500 and 900, then I would be pretty happy. But that's how we can calculate the resistor. Now, ultimately, as much as this is new information to you guys, it is still just using, um, it is still, just using um, voltage dividers. You, we actually just did this exact same question no more than 10 minutes ago when we were looking at the question for the attendance question. We knew a resistance, we knew a resistance for R2, we knew the voltage out, we knew the voltage in, we just needed to calculate what R1 was. We actually already did this example and we actually did it the same way. We use the resistance and the voltage to find the current, and then we use that current to find this resistor. We did the same steps. Now it looks very different. I get that. Don't worry. I'm not like going to sit here and be like, "Oh man, you guys probably saw that one from a mile away." It looks very different because in this one we actually have to work out. We actually have to work out the resistance a little bit more using this graph. But ultimately, it's not too far from what we were doing before. Um, let's look at light-dependent resistors. Now, light-dependent resistors. This is a new. Uh, this is the second of the three um, things I wanted to talk about. Light-dependent resistors change their resistance depending on how much light falls on them. Light-dependent resistors have high resistance in the dark. 
They don't like the dark. They're afraid of the dark. But low resistance in light. LL. Low resistance light. High resistance in the dark. Where could they be used? They could be used in cameras, street lights, night lights, doorway sensors. These are the sensors that, of course, if you have a laser or a light and they shine a light into a sensor, we'll call this sensor the LDR. If you block the LDR and you, um, if you block the sensor here, then that will mean the LDR will go dark, which will mean that it will send a, a high voltage. And then that will, you know, maybe open the door. So that's taking, and again, that's a very simple, a basic component. You're saying transducer, you're taking information in, there is no more light, you're converting that, signal processing that, you, that leads to, I'm going to open the door. Now, it might be a bit more complex than that. By the way, I really quickly want to point out, I didn't point this out. The symbol for thermistor, oh my God, I really should put this on the slide. The symbol for thermistor looks like this. The symbol for a LDR, I think usually, now I don't get, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think it's usually just this. It's just a regular resistor, it's just to get colored in instead of normal. So there's some examples of where we could use it. There are many other places where you could use an LDR, anywhere where you need to detect light. So you might be like some kind of like a solar panel farm where you want to make sure it might be like, oh, weather detection, you know, when it gets dark, you know, you might want to do um turn on a light outside. Um, yeah, there are lots of different places where you could use this. Um, one, oh, that might be one. When it gets dark, you might want your roller doors, your windows to automatically close. So you might have that hooked up to a circuit. I want to show you guys this circuit. Now, this is a different idea. Well, I could have very easily done a very similar question to this for LDRs, but I thought I'd show you this because it's a little bit different. Um, we've got three examples here of an LDR and being exposed to light or not light. Now let's remember, LDR is, has a high R in the dark. So there's a high R, it's a high resistance in the dark, but a low in low resistance in the light. So in this example here on the left, this is a series circuit. If I shine a light on it, then I've got low resistance, which means that a lot more voltage can get dropped over here. So therefore this is going to, so a low voltage, so low resistance which means low voltage drop, which means a high voltage drop can go over the um, light bulb and yeah so that's that's how this circuit works and this is an actual circuit you could find a use for it i'm sure there is a reason why you might want to do this but in this case in a lot of situations when you've got light shining on something you probably don't want to turn on another light bulb what you really want is when light isn't shining on something for the light bulb to go on so here we've got two examples We've got a parallel circuit. Now we'll grab a look at this. Light is shining on this, right? This provides low resistance, whereas this is high resistance. Now, because this provides low resistance, more current is going to go through the through the LDR rather than only a tiny bit of current is going to go through the light bulb. So while light is shining on it it's actually going to mean the light bulb doesn't turn on. This is actually really similar to a short circuit. And in fact, we can sometimes use short circuits to our advantage. Like let's create a path which has very, very little resistance. So there is, would be some voltage going through that light bulb, but so little of it is that, you know, ultimately the um, light bulb doesn't turn on. So it's like a short circuit, but I guess because it's an LDR, it is still a resistor. It's still, it's not going to burn through the wire like a 
proper short circuit work. But you can think about it as the electricity is going to take the path of least resistance. In this situation, the path of least resistance is through the LDR. But in the dark, we have a high resistance. When there's no light shining on, we have a high resistance. So now the current's going to take the path of least resistance, which is the path through the light bulb, which means that more current is going to go through that light bulb, which means that ultimately the light bulb is going to turn on. And this is actually a really interesting circuit. So now when the light is on, when the light is on, the light bulb is off. When the light is off, the light bulb is on. And we could actually do a very similar circuit to, yeah, we could actually do a question like this in the circuit and create and do it and we could actually figure it out. Let me show you what it might look like in an actual circuit. Here's an actual circuit. It's, um, this is very similar to the first one. So in the dark, so if you think about this again, let's go back over this. In the dark, we have high resistance, which is gonna be, um, I'm actually, instead of doing high resistance, I'm just gonna do this. We're gonna have high resistance, which is gonna be high voltage drop. So that means that this in the dark, R2, is going to have low voltage. Then the light, everything swaps around. The resistance is going to go down. The voltage drop is going to go down. Therefore, the it's going to have high resist, high voltage over I two, and that might mean that you know this could be for like I don't know roller doors or something. When light gets too bright, we want this to trigger a roll a door that will close to you know protect us from the harmful uv rays or something but again this is just and this is also another way we can draw what an ldr looks like it's a resistor with light going into it um i'm gonna have to double check later on what the actual symbols for these things are because i'm a bit embarrassed i don't know what they are but that's how an ldr would work in a circuit what i want you guys to understand this is not this here isn't anything specifically new this is just you taking an idea and applying it taking this idea of the path of least resistance and applying it in actual circuits and i want you guys to be able to understand how this works not because it'll be helpful for you guys if you get a question with an ldr but because it'll be helpful for you guys to understand circuits and understand how i've done these things also this technique that I'm using here, I, yeah, I'm not, I came up with this technique, it's not necessarily like groundbreaking, but the idea that I usually do is this, I don't like writing lots of words like low voltage, high voltage, I will draw arrows. If the resistance goes up, what does that mean for the voltage? The voltage goes up. You could say the same thing, what does it mean for the current? The current actually goes down, so I'll do an arrow. But, and I like to draw arrows, I like to use pitches, especially when I'm taking notes, because it will make things a lot clearer to me faster. The last one that I wanted to talk to you guys about was um, the last transducer I think I'm talking to you guys about today is the diode. Now diodes are very non-ohmic. A diode is a one-way component. It's actually really interesting. It only allows, it has, one way has a very, very little resistance. One way, your current can go through this without any problems. The other way has a huge amount of resistance. You can't go backwards. It's like imagine you've got a stream, the stream looks like this. Lots and lots of water can easily go down this way, but the water that goes back down this way will always hit a wall. And this is why the symbol is a symbol it is. Ultimately, the symbol is the way it is because it's easy for things to get funneled in down here, but it's very, very hard for things to go back the other way. Now, we usually have a technical word for this. We can call this bias or polarized. And the current flows through in one direction, the arrow. Um, the reason we have these in circuits is sometimes some particular components 
will work really well when electricity goes one way through them, but you can't take electricity going backwards and forwards to them. So because we have AC circuits, and if you remember AC alternating current means that the direction of a current changes every second, we will sometimes use diodes to make sure that the, uh, that certain components are only getting a one-way feed of, of uh, electricity. It's not going backwards and forwards, it's only going in one way. An LED is a light emitting diode. It's just like a regular diode, it just happens to emit light as current goes through. And we use these all the time now in modern days because there's so much efficient incandescent bulbs. And so, yeah. And they come in a range of colors and yeah last but not least a diode has a switch on voltage and so it's usually connected in series with a resistor to ensure it isn't overloaded what do i mean by switched on voltage i'll tell you what i mean by switched on voltage but before i do that let me just summarize the key points here are that le the diodes are non-ohmic resistors they are they are biased, so they'll let current go through one way, but not the other way. They're the main two points of them. What do I mean by switch on voltage? Grab a look at this. A student is investigating the current voltage characteristics of a diode using the circuit shown in figure A. And the IV graph for the diode is illustrated in B. The current in the circuit is measured as 4.5 milliamp. Now, what's the potential difference across the diode? Well, if we wanted to solve this, we could figure this out. 4.5 milliamps is here. I go across and I go down. And what do you know? Oops, I can't draw across and down what do you know that falls at 6.6 .6 volts notice how it's pretty much a straight line that means if we were looking at 5 milliamps 6 milliamps 7 milliamps 8 milliamps it's always going to drop 0 0.6 volts this is really not only because you guys know the more current that goes through something the more voltage it should drop um, but that's not what's going on here. It's always dropping the same amount of voltage. So that's what makes this really weird. That's what makes this non, uh, this was makes this non omic. What you should see is a graph that looks like this. As the voltage goes up, as the current goes up, the voltage drop goes up, you know? But that's not what's going on here. You're still dropping the same amount of voltage, but the current's getting more and more and more. So, what can we draw what can we now say about this information well we know this is um that this diode here is dropping 0 0.6 volts how much is this resistor dropping can someone tell me really quick Beautiful. Thank you for the 5.4. 6 volts minus 0 0.6. Now, what's kind of cool is that this will change more voltage will get dropped over it the more this changes but even if this was 12 volts this will always drop 0 0.6 volts it always will do that and in um, we call this a switch on voltage if you have a battery which has less than 0 0.6 volts pretty much your resistor is just not going to conduct current but once you go past 0 0.6, well, it's fine. So that means that what's the resistance? We've got, um, well, we need to work out the current, I suppose. Um, well, we've got a 5.4 volt 
voltage drop. The current is four milliamps. So let's do this. R1 equals V1 divided by I1. V1 happens to be 5.4. I1 happens to be 0 0.004 milliamps. That's going to give us 5.4 divided by 4 milliamps. 1350 amps. Now, yeah, it wouldn't matter. And the part that I find interesting is that, like, it's always going to, in this circuit, it would always drop 5.4 volts. If you had a higher current, it would still drop 5.4 volts. If you, but yeah, this is how you would deal with a um with the diode so what i've done is and before i move on is i've done three different ways to look at uh three different ways the first one is i looked at a graph and used that graph to deal with a voltage divider now i could have done that same thing with an ldr but instead i decided to look at the ldr as just as a basic parallel circuit what's going to happen how is it going to how does this link to short circuits and stuff like that path of least resistance the last thing i talked about was diodes diodes gave us a chance to use the iv chart that we've already used before but it gives us another chance to really explore it if i know the current then what is the voltage and then of course i can use the basics of v equals ir because it still has to follow some laws especially that second resistor r1 it has to follow ohm's law just because the diode doesn't follow Ohm's law doesn't mean the resistor gets to oh, not follow it. Also, by the way, we can tell that this resistor is pointing the right way. Because if I go, this diode is pointing the right way. Because if I follow the current along, the arrows line up. Now, what I'm going to talk about now is we're going to now discuss the last little bit which is just to be going to be a really quick um idea here you can calculate the power in a circuit or through a component using p equals vi now i they spent a whole page on this in the textbook i am going to spend literally like 20 seconds talking about it let's figure out the power the power drop through each of these resistors. Oh, whoopsies. Ah, resistor A, B, C. All right, so the total resistance is going to be the resistance of A plus the resistance of B plus the resistance of C, which is going to be 9 plus 8, which is 17. Um, 17 plus 7 is going to be 24 kilo ohms. Careful. Which means that the total current is going to be the total voltage divided by the total resistance, which is going to be 6 divided by 24, which is going to be over 0 0.25, 24,000, sorry. Two point five times ten to negative four, or zero point two five uh, milliamps. No, that's really low. That's okay. That means that I can now use that information to calculate the individual voltage drops. But so um, let's do that now. So um, VA is going to be zero point. Uh, it's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 times uh, 9,000. That's going to be 2.25 volts. VB is going to be. Um, Two volts 
and then therefore V C is going to be 1.75 volts. I actually just did that by going 6 minus 2 minus 2.25 equals 1.75 volts. But that's not really what the question is asking. Let's work out what the power loss over each of these resistors are. So to do that, we would just go, well, P equals VI. So therefore the power loss here is going to be 2.25 times 2.25 times uh, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4. 2.25 times 2.5 10 to the negative 4, which is 5.6. Let's just go with that. That's, you know what? I can't be bothered. 5.6 milliwatts. I can't be bothered. No, 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 no. No, 0 0.56 milliwatt. Um, there's some extra numbers here, 625. I'm just getting lazy here, people. Um, some of you guys might be thinking to yourself, ah, that's a lot of effort. Is there a shortcut? Believe it or not, I just realized we didn't actually need to work out these voltages. It was nice, but we still could have just used P equals I squared R. Now that we know what I is, we just can go that times this, and then we would have got the same answer. But still, doesn't matter. We can just quickly power through these. Uh, let's maybe use that. Let's try. Let's try that for this one. P equals I squared R. So let's go. Two point five times ten to the negative four squared times eight thousand, and that's still going to give you two point five times. 10 to the negative 4 squared times 8,000 is going to be 0 0.5 milliwatts. And then over here, we're going to have, um, here we're going to just do, yep, um, 1.75 times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4, which gives you 0 0.4. With 0 0.44 uh, milliwatts. The total power loss is going to be 0 0.56 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.44 milliwatts and that will give you the answer um or or you could find the total power loss by just going total um voltage times the current so 0 point uh, so 2.5 e to the negative 4 times 6 1.5 so that's going to come out to be 1.5 milliwatts. And that's, yeah, uh, instead of times 10, writing times 10, negative 3, I just did that. So the idea of this is just basically when you want to find out the power loss, you just need to use the power loss formulas that we've already learned and apply them to these particular places. Right, guys. That's it for what I wanted to talk to you guys about today.